anybody who ever told me about anything personally knowing God or anything supernatural other than historically what I knew from stories from the Bible. Um, never met one person who told me they had a real relationship with Jesus. Never knew about uh, the need to really come into a relationship with, with the Lord through Jesus. And uh, I was busy getting it on. But, you know, there's not enough excitement in the world to ever satisfy. You always got to have more. And I like stuff that was edgy, you know, advent, you know, skiing. And, and I always liked uh, aviation stuff. And so I started taking flying lessons. And I, I thought it would be more fun jumping out of airplanes. So I became a sport parachutist. And that really got me. I mean, I became obsessed with skydiving. It really consumed my life. My existence uh, revolved around that 30 to 60 seconds in free fall and that five minute parachute ride, then I had to do it again. It's like, mm -hmm. like a drug, you know, it's, it's almost good. Like an addiction. Oh, totally. And then all of a sudden, one night, all that was going to change. Shortly after takeoff, I don't really recall much because I was kind of dozing off, uh, sitting next to the pilot, or actually sitting on the floor next to the pilot where we removed the seats in this new aircraft. And I was awakened by a sound that unfamiliar to me. It was the sound of the motor going completely silent. Uh -oh. And the pilot turned to me and he slapped me. He says, That's it, we're going down. So we just pitched forward and we're, wow. we plummeted straight down at over 100 miles an hour and what was seen out of the cockpit and this was told to me, I don't recall this, but we were going straight to the ground and we're headed right towards a gigantic oak tree. We did it, hit that tree going, like I said, over 100 miles an hour and my face stopped my body going 100 miles an hour. So wow. I, uh, then the airplane cartwheel on its wings and slammed into the ground. If you see pictures of the aircraft, it doesn't look like anybody could survive this. So there was obviously injury and confusion, and the two students got pushed out the doorway and by one of my friends who was a very experienced jumper. And the fourth man out saw me moving, and the pilot assumed we were leaving too. And just as he was going out, the plane went up in flames. And as he was running away, he heard screaming and realized I was trapped inside along with the pilot. And this brave man who was my friend and went back in the plane and saw me trying to jump, escape where the wing had been torn loose from the mm -hmm. airplane. But I was stuck, and but something in my my uh, equipment or my mm -hmm. clothing it was caught, and I was soaked with fuel, and it was on fire oh, from head to toe, wow. and just like you see in movies, a person whose whole body was engulfed in flames, and and this is where God did the first miracle. This man grabbed a hold of my parachute harness, and with his bare hands, tore that loose. It's two thousand pounds tensile strength in each one of those straps. Wow. Pulled so hard he pulled his thumbs out of his sockets. Dragged me away from the plane and slapped the fire out. It kept reigniting, and then he tried to go back for the pilot, and he couldn't. He was burned alive. Well, they rushed me off to the hospital. Obviously, it was horrible, and uh, uh, they rushed me off to the hospital and saw that I sustained very serious injuries. I had a brain injury. I had burns over a large portion of my body. I had to find out my eye was blind, my right eye was blind, uh, and, you know, tremendous cuts and, you know, this shock of, you know, that crash. They told my family I was going to die. They told my sister to come that day because I wasn't going to be there in the afternoon. I had an experience I had never heard about, never heard anything like this. Uh, um, as I was laying there in that condition, just racked with pain and, mm -hmm. and discomfort in every way possible, suddenly my my inner man, the real me, my spirit, sat up out of my body, and I could feel my legs go through the springs of the bed, wow. and my spirit came out of my body as if you would take a glove off your hand, and instantly I was in a spiritual world. Instantaneously, I knew this was the real world, and this man that I was seeing was the real me. Now, when that happened, were you aware of any pain still? Or no, I was totally com com no. completely separated from the pain in the carcass. Completely that you no, behind? and I didn't even remember. I turned around looking. I mean, I was mm -hmm. I was transferred immediately into a spiritual dimension, mm -hmm. and everything about the spirit world is more real than this world. Mm -hmm. The colors are mm -hmm. brighter. The edges of everything are sharper. The emotions are are just High enhanced. Hand. They are clear, and instantaneously, the thing that that really struck me the most was there was a complete absence of the awareness of time. Everything in this world is relative to time. You know, you mm -hmm. got up this morning, you'll go to bed at night, something is old, uh, something is new, it will get, get old, something is born, it will die. Everything in this plane, in the physical plane, in the natural plane, is relative mm -hmm. to time. But everything in the spiritual plane is relative to eternity. So what had been natural to be aware of time right. was totally gone. And I was totally aware of eternity. It is shocking, it is stunning to be to be conscious and to know what eternity is. Also, logic and reasoning doesn't happen there. You know, based on the sum total of all my intelligent thoughts that I've learned, you know, I've, I've had a death and I'm in the spirit world. It's like you just know that you know that you know. You just, it's like having a revelation constantly. And that's, it was incredible. And I was, I was, I knew I was traveling. I could feel, mm -hmm. you know, that I was traveling. And as I looked ahead, there was this pure white light. It was whiter than the whitest snow and brighter than 10,000 suns. And yet I could look right at it and it was compelling. And it was like I was 
being towed. Being I was I'm being towed yeah. like a tractor being. And, and as I was looking, I, I could feel this anticipation. Wow. But then simultaneously, that on my right side, I could feel something, and I looked, and there was this blackness sweeping. Now this blackness, as I looked at it, instantly I was aware of its complete nature. It was eternal, like I was experiencing eternity. It was without any matter. It was without any life. It was void, and it was forever non-negotiable, cut off from the source of all life. And the more that I looked at it, the faster it would sweep, and the faster, and the more that that occurred, the more intense the feeling of the nature of being cut off and sealed oh, forever and whoa. separated it is hor Horrifying. horrific, yeah. horrific. You would not. I used to never be able to stand to be near anybody who could say go to hell after that, because you wouldn't want the worst person. No. You wouldn't want Adolf Hitler. Ben Laden, Saddam, you wouldn't want any human being to ever go in there. It was wow. so horrible. And as that was sweeping, it got down to, it was eclipsing this light. So there was just a, it was like you're in a room and you close the door, a dark room, and there's a little space between the door and the door jam. It wasn't a doorway, it was really, this was a real place that I was seeing and that I was feeling. And as it was closing, it was eclipsing, and now I'm standing on the very edge, the precipice of eternal separation. And I scream out of my spirit, I'm sorry, I want to live. Give me another chance. And, and just before that was to close, I was standing in the presence of Almighty God. Whoa. And instantly I knew I would never die for eternity. And that's, that's I mean, mercy. it's unbelievable. Wow. And instantly I knew that this being who off, was off on, on this side of me, uh, who I didn't see, but I was standing in this river of golden radiation. It looked like a moving river of golden light. And this river went that way, it went that way, it was underneath me, it was going right through me. And this river was alive. I don't know how to describe it, except that this, it's called the river, of life, that this river was alive. And I was, and it's going right through me, and I'm, I'm more alive than anybody can imagine. I mean, this is the height of the experience of life, it filled up with life. And, I, and somehow I knew this being was going to take care of me for eternity. I didn't see the New Jerusalem, I didn't see any angels in heaven, I didn't see any people who had gone before me. This was the max. So I was so filled with, with just the, the love and the, all of God's majesty, all of His authority, all of His love, everything was just flowing through me. I was like vibrating, like a tuning for oh, wow. the very essence of, of God's nature. But when God spoke to me, and not in a language like you and I are talking now, but the knowledge of His purpose, the word of His purpose, came in through that same light. And I was, I was taken back to the same way I left, so like being reeled in like a kite, and I went down through space and time, this dimension. As my spirit settled into my body, and I could start to hear out of these ears and see out of this eye. I came to in the room, materialized, kind of like they beam up on Star Trek. Right. And I heard myself speaking in this beautiful language that I had known, never heard anybody talk about before. The heavenly language. Yeah, it was a beautiful language. And when my brain turned on, I thought, what in the heck is this other language? And I was no longer, uh, the person who was dying and dead was no, was no longer. And I was born again and filled with the Holy, Holy Ghost. I never heard about that. You know, for years I wondered, what was that blackness and why did it sweep down to where it was just a sliver like about a half inch of white light and years later God revealed it to me it was really a historical record of my life that for all the years that I had lived I was in darkness and God gave me a space to cry out to him and in that space it changed my future my destiny my whole purpose really I was God loved me the whole time God was with me but you know don't let please don't wait until you're that desperate. We're desperate right now, and he's, he's with you, and he, you, know, you have a chance today to cry out to God. It's not complicated. It's not religious. I mean, certainly my prayer wasn't all that complicated, and it wasn't about religion. It was about I needed life, and there is no one of us before God that doesn't need the whole life that he has to offer. It's usually fear that keeps us from doing that, or, or, or like we're afraid, well, I'm not good enough. That's the whole deal. We need God. It's an interesting uh, testimony, isn't it? And so I, th I thought I'd show you that before we get into the message. And uh, um, let's pray over the message. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you for this opportunity for me to give the word and Leslie to, to give the word here this morning. Father, you know that our hearts are right. You know, Father God, that we desire to see people know the truth. And because you said, Lord, that when you know the truth and, and, and do the truth, it'll set you free. And so, Father, I thank you for 
uh, just ministering this word to each and every heart in here. And Father, we take authority over every, every hindering spirit. We, we bind the enemy in any way from hindering one person from hearing this word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 And so I wanted um, Sister Leslie to read a prophecy given by Kenneth Hagin. It was in 1987. And it was uh, about the last days. And she was actually listening to this from Sid Roth's program. And then Sister Marcia sent me, sent me the same prophecy. I thought, confirmation. <laughs> and uh, so um, I want you to hear what uh, Brother Hagen had to say, because I, th- I believe that it will encourage you. I believe that it will get you um, refreshed. How many times, how many know sometimes we can, we can get weary the Bible says don't get weary in doing good because you will reap a harvest if you just stay in there and don't, don't, uh, don't give up on the Lord and don't give up on what he's called you to do because God has a plan for all of us. And in these last days, it's a, it's a pleasure to be alive. Yes. It's a pleasure to be um, on Team Jesus. How many are on Team Jesus? If you're not, you can switch teams. You can get on today, right? <laughs> and, uh, but Leslie's going to read this. I think it'll bless you. So as he was saying, you definitely don't want to miss out on what's getting ready to happen in our world. So it's, this is exciting. I was listening to this this morning, and I was getting fired up. I said, honey, you gotta, you got to listen to that. Because he told me Sister Marcia had sent it to him. I said, oh, well, I think you need to listen to it before this morning's message. Because I had a little bit of insight on what he was going to be speaking on. So, and he actually had something else different for me to read this morning. But then after he heard that, he said, oh, well, maybe you need to read that one instead. So, yep, I'm excited about it. So, it's a prophecy given by Kenneth Hagin in 1987 on the last days. The seer shall stand on the horizon of time and see that which God has planned and know its purpose. Standing on the horizon of time... He shall look back into the realm of time and see that which the enemy has planned. Yeah, 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 said the Lord of hosts. This is the time of restoration. This is the time of visitation, the time of fresh renewing and outpouring. And so the visitation of the Lord shall be greater in these days than it was yesterday. And the manifestation of his power and glory shall be a hundredfold more than it was yesterday's manifestation, or supernatural miracles shall increase a hundredfold more than we've known in the past. Yeah, the glory of God shall be seen upon the face of many, and many without a word being spoken, just looking upon the face of the man of God shall fall down in repentance and cry out to God, members of that body, enhanced by the Spirit, on fire and maintaining the glow. Men and women in the world shall look upon their faces and fall down and say, I don't know what makes me do this. Yeah, the power of God shall be in manifestation, and your heart shall be rejoicing, and you shall be glad. And the work of God shall be consumed, and many things that have spoken even unto men of God who sit in this place and shake their heads and say, Oh, that cannot be so. The work of God coming into the spirits by the women of God and men of God, and they declared by human reasoning, that is impossible. That cannot be so. But yes, saith the Lord of hosts, All things are possible to him that believes. And with me, all things are possible. And the impossible shall become possible. And even many have said, it is possible, but not profitable. Yeah, even the probable shall come into manifestation. And your hearts shall be made to rejoice. And your spirits shall be glad. And the work of God shall be enhanced. And the kingdom of God shall be advanced. And sitting upon the horizon of times and looking not only in the realm of the spirit and seeing that which 
transpires in the spirit realm, for the enemy goeth out as never before, knowing that his time is short. Thou shalt know and thou shalt share. And those who know how to pray will rise up in this hour and then intercede. And the forces of darkness shall be driven back. And the evil spirits and the powers of the enemy that would encroach on the things of God, the people of God, will be driven back. And so it is that the church shall stand tall in this hour and shall stand big in this hour and rejoice in his power and looking into the realm of time, not limited by time or space. Yeah, I looked, looked, I looked, and I saw the hearts of men, and oh, how they were disturbed and perplexed. And I saw a black, dark cloud rise up from the eastern part of our nation, and it came out of the capital of our nation. And men responded unto that darkness that arose and walked with it. And that darkness began to envelop this very land. But oh, oh, the hearts of many that know God sensed in their spirits. And those of us that stand on the horizon of the time shall sound forth a word of warning. And so there shall rise the mighty ones, those called of God, separated unto him. And they shall make intercession, and the light shall shine and drive back the darkness. The evil and wicked men shall fall, and there will be those. And remember, it was told unto you in advance. It was told unto you in years in advance. There shall be those in high places who will fall down dead. And some shall say, oh, they would have made such a great leader. I cannot understand, but those who know the voice of the Spirit shall rejoice and be glad, for you shall know the dark. That darkness has been stayed, and the hand of the enemy has been defeated. And the word of the Lord that is to be consummated in those few short years, too, will be will be consummated, and the work of the Lord shall be done. And so that work, which shall be done in this hour, and the visitation of the Spirit, and that revival that is about to burst open, you shall surely come to pass. And many, 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 as the world would say, hordes of people shall be swept into the kingdom. And even in places of this earth of seemingly uttermost darkness, the light shall shine in, and men and women shall rise up and exercise the authority that is theirs on this earth. For if two or three of you shall agree on earth in any nation, in any land, regardless of the government, regardless of the opposition, and regardless of the darkness, of two, if two of you on this earth... In North America, yes, in South America, yes, in Central America, yes, in Asia, yes, in Europe, and yes, in Australia, yes, behind the Iron Curtain, and of any nation of the earth, if two of you shall agree as touching anything they shall ask, <clears throat> it shall be done for them by my Father, which is in heaven. For whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And remember, it's in the first heaven, just above the earth, where the demons and evil spirits are ruling whole nations. They must be bound. Isaiah 27, 1 and 2. And whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And those spirits that dominate whole nations and that dominate certain corners of the earth shall be bound, and the light shall shine, and the Holy Ghost shall be poured out. The revival will come, and hearts and lives of men and women shall be blessed, and whole nations shall be changed. And you shall enter into a new day, a new age, not a new age as man thinks, 
and you shall see that there shall be a manifestation at the end of this age, a portion, a measure of power, the glory that shall be manifested in the age to come. And you approach that time now, for these are the times of refreshing from the hand of the Lord, from the presence of the Lord, and the time of giving from the hand of the Lord, and the time of manifestation by the Holy Ghost and the glory of the Lord. So rejoice and be glad. Let not your hearts be sad, neither be pessimistic, but rather you look forward to the future with optimism, with gladness and love, for the light has shined and the glory revealed. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. And so let's just, if you just bow your heads a minute here, let's just uh, come together and bind uh, the enemy over our region and over our state and over our country in Jesus' name. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, Lord. We come to you as, as believers uh, set aside and um, made holy before you, Lord God, to do your work. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, we bind every demonic spirit that's hindering this community and hindering this state, Lord God, and even this country. We call them down off of assignment. We call them down off of their high and lofty perch right now in the name of Jesus, for the kingdom of God will advance and the glory of God will fill the whole earth. And we, Father, will be amongst that number, Lord, for we are faithful. We are here. We are ready. We're not tired. We're, we're energized. And we're ready, Lord God, to, to advance your kingdom, advance the name of Jesus. And we're ready, Lord, to be soul winners, to bring the harvest in. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Well, praise God. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 12, verse 4. And we're going to talk about, how many know the Bible says is we're going to read here that his eye is on the sparrow. You know, Jesus said um, God's eye is on the sparrow. And there was even a song that was wrote about it and says, I, that says, I know he watches over me. And so we understand that when Jesus came on the earth, he came to die on the cross, right? That was his main purpose. He who knew no sin became sin. Jesus became a human being to die on the cross for the sins of the whole world. That was God's master plan. It was a great plan because the Bible says if Satan would have understood that plan, he would have never crucified the Son of God. But the devil doesn't know everything, does he? And so Jesus came and, and he died on that cross for the for the sins of the world, so that we could be set free. Jesus also came, when Jesus lived his life on this earth, he lived to be 33, 33 and a half years of age. He never sinned. You know who else pulled that off? No one. He's the only one that has lived and never sinned. And so Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the old Jewish law. The Jewish law, that law of sin and death, was in place for just a certain amount of time until Jesus could come and fulfill it. So Jesus didn't throw the law away. He fulfilled it. He completed it. He did it for me and you. He dotted every I and crossed every T. He completely fulfilled the, requ the righteous requirements of that and then took our place on the cross and died the death of a sinner. He never sinned. I have to make that clear. But he died the death of a sinner. He took the curse on him. He became the curse so that we could be set free from the curse. But let's not forget that Jesus also rose victoriously from the dead. He also um, came back to life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And now he's our Lord and Savior. He's the head of the church. And he is the soon coming king. The first time Jesus came, he came as a baby in a manger. And he came as the spotless lamb to take away the sins of the world. When he comes back, comes back the next time, he's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. He's coming back to defeat and to destroy Satan and the sin uh, uh, of Satan's army. And we're going to be in that number. 
And so we have to be encouraged. But another thing that Jesus did to the, in, in, in his ministry, he taught them the loving nature of Abba, Father. Well, that can be translated Daddy God. He taught them about God's loving nature. Now, David had a glimpse of God's loving nature, but not many of them did. I believe that's why David was, was called the apple of God's eye and a man after God's own heart. Because David had a supernatural extra ability to just see the heart of God. David is the one that said, you formed me in my mother's womb. You fashioned me and formed me. David said, no matter where I go, I can't escape the presence and the love of God. He had this extraordinary ability just to see the loving nature of God. But most of the Jews didn't understand God that way. Remember, when Jesus was on the earth, he was ministering primarily to the Jews. And talking to them, they were under the old covenant law. And so, but there's going to be a new and living way, a new way coming. And so he's, he's getting them to know the love of their father. And what way, better way to know the love of the father than to know what Jesus is about, all about? For John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world. What does, world, what does love do? He gave. He gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's anybody. The Bible says all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's love. And so in this passage of scripture, we're going to see that God, that Jesus is showing them about the love of the Father. And, and, and listen to these words. It's a tender, tender, intimate love of God. How do you believe God is when he looks at you? Do you think that when God looks at you, he sees all of your failure? Do you think that he criticizes you? I know there's critical people on the earth, but don't put God in their category. You don't have to earn God's love. He already loves you. And not only does he already love you, you can't do anything about it. He's going to love you forever. Those very people that are in hell today, God loves them too. And the Bible says that God doesn't want anyone to perish. But they must be repentant. See, hell is full of rebellion. Heaven is full of repentant people. Two different heart areas. If one rejects Jesus Christ and the Lordship of Jesus Christ, there's no other way. There's no other answer. He is the one who died and paid the price for the sin. He is the spotless lamb. He is God's way. That's why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There's no other way to be righteous or right with God other than through Jesus Christ. But it takes a repentance. It takes a sincerity of heart to say, Lord, I, I need you. Lord, I thank you. I receive your sacrifice for my sins, and I accept that. And Lord, be, be my Lord and Savior. And the Bible says when you do, you'll be saved. You'll be born again. Born again in the Spirit. You are a spirit being. You live in a body and you possess a soul, which is your mind and your will and your, your will and your emotions, the part of you that connects with the natural world. But you are first and foremost spiritual. You are a spirit being that will live forever. And that's what we're about is getting people born again, getting them into the kingdom. And then as we live our life here on this earth as a born again believer, the Bible says that we are to live it with a, a reverential fear of God. Not a fear that, uh, the wrong kind of fear is, is the fear that God will harm us or God wants to hurt us. No, that's not God's intent for us. We are to have a reverential fear though. That's a respect and an awe and just a, a, a reverence for God and to, to know that he is God. And we also are to know that he watches over us and we are, we, we, what are we gonna do with this life that he, give, he has given us? Are we gonna glorify him? You know, we're to have that kind of respect for, for God. To know that he is who he says he is. And the Bible says in 1 Peter, it says that we're not redeemed. 1 Peter 1.17, it says we're not redeemed with 
uh, corruptible things. Redeemed means purchased, right? What were we purchased from? We were purchased from Satan. We were purchased from darkness. We were purchased from everlasting life, everlasting death. We were purchased from eternal separation from God. How, do, how were we purchased? The Bible says in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That shows you how much you're loved. And so look at Luke 12, 4. He says, and I say to you, my friends, Luke 12, 4, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you shall fear. Fear him who after he has killed has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. And so he's saying, have a reverential fear for God, for God has the power. Amen. God has the power to keep you out of a place called hell. Now you can look at me because I'm mentioning hell a lot. And you can look at me as a mean uh, hellfire and brimstone preacher. Or you can look at me as someone that's telling you the truth. And giving you an opportunity to escape that place. Because that place is real. Because Jesus said it's real. Amen. And one thing the devil does. He tries to, he tries to make that hell a... Uh, uh, a myth or tries to do away with it because he's a deceiver. I found it interesting. One of my, my one um, uh, sermon I put on Facebook, the devil is a liar. Sometimes, you know, we're getting it out there a good bit and there's people who comment. I don't even care really. Let them do what they want to do. But someone said, Tell me where, where it says that the devil lies. Oh, come on. I don't even want to. What am I going to do with that, right? He is a liar. Jesus said he is the father of lies. Maybe that person will listen to this message again. That comes with the territory. You're getting the word out. People are going to come against you and strike against the word. You can, if you want to find out about Kenneth Hagin, you can Google him and you can find a lot of stuff about him. But, a, but there's a lot of it out there that it's no good. They say terrible things about him. So don't, go, don't listen to those things. Go to, go, go to rhema.org and, and, and go to rhema ministries and, and find out that way. The devil's not going to stand by and let us just spew out the goodness of God without telling lies and trying to discredit and trying to put us down. But that's okay. He loses. There is a great revival coming to this nation. A great revival. There is a great coming in of people that, the, put it this way, I heard somebody say, Jesus said we are, fish, we are to be fishers of men. We're to go out there and, and, and comparison uh, comparing bringing people into the kingdom of God to fishing there's coming a day very soon where the fish are going to jump in the boat they're going to come to us and say I got to know the God that you know I got to know why you have so much joy I got to know why you have so much peace I got to know why you're, you're so calm I got to I got to know what makes you tick because I see God in you that's the most biggest compliment anybody could ever give you if they say, I see God in you. That's why don't go out there and act like the world. You're not called to act like the world. You're called to act like children of God. You're called to be a peculiar people. You're called to be different. Different in, in, in your actions. Different in your word. Different in your love walk. You're to, be, you're to be above all that stuff because you have the love of God in your heart and the spirit of God in you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So Jesus is saying, look, don't fear those people that they, they, they're threatening to take your life because in this time, they, they kill people all the time. In some of countries, they still kill people for the, for the gospel. He's saying, don't be afraid of them, people that can kill your body. You have a reverence and a respect and an understanding to know that God is over it all. Amen. And when you serve God, you got it right. Because there's no one like God. Amen. 
He is above all others. He is supreme. He is above all others. And one day, he's coming to take this earth back. Yes, the devil's the, the ruler of this age, and he's running around, and he's destroying and doing all that stuff. But he doesn't have to destroy the church if we don't let him. Amen. We can take authority over him, but he doesn't have it forever. His time will run out. Amen? Just know that. God will establish his kingdom on this earth again. And the church is just a forerunner to that. And, and, a, and a glimpse for people to see what's to come down the road. You're on the winning team. But look at, look at um, verse 6. Here he talks about the intimacy. This is Jesus. He says, are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Look at this. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So you see how Jesus says, do not fear, therefore. He's saying, don't be afraid of the world. Don't be afraid of their threats. Don't be afraid of, of, of all those things. Don't, don't be afraid of that. The very hairs on your head are numbered. Is that intimacy or not? We love our children, do we not? Our biological children. How many of you have ever sat down to count the hair on their head? That would be a task. I don't think we could do it, right? God loves you so much. He knows the number of hairs on your head. This is Jesus. Telling them, this is how God sees you. This is how your father looks at you. Do you see God that way? I do. And then in verse 8, he goes on to say, Also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man will also confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me, before men will be denied before the angels of God. So it all comes down to Jesus. Just like we, the song we had sung earlier, Jesus is the center of it all. Everything comes down to Jesus. What say you about Jesus? What say you? Who do you say he is? Do you say that he's the son of God? Do you say that he died on the cross for the sins of the world? Do you say that he rose from the dead and God rose him from the dead? If you can believe that, you believe that to be true, you got one more step. Confess him as your Lord. Believe in him in your heart. The Bible says you'll be saved. That's love, isn't it? I mean, there's a reason for the cross. Jesus had to die a brutal death because sin is terrible. Sin, sin separates us from God if we don't have Jesus. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission or no forgiveness of sin. Sin is terrible. Yes, God's holy. He's clean. He's pure. There's none of that in God. None of that. And sometimes we look at ourselves and we, we, we try to be like Adam and Eve and run from God like they did in the Garden of Eden when they sinned. You don't have to run from God if you take Jesus because Jesus will cleanse you of that sin. He'll make you brand new in the spirit. Even the world doesn't, the world doesn't have to run from God. God is after the world. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. God's not after someone, as not after people to beat them down or to destroy their lives. He doesn't destroy. He's a builder. He's a creator. Satan destroys, steals, kills, and destroys. And Jesus is saying, the hair on your head, God knows the number of those hairs. Because we came from God. I want you to look at Luke 16, verse 19. This is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. This is an actual account of two people who died. And it gives us, a, gives us a vivid description of two people after they have died. What went on. And so this will help. There's a lot of people 
I mean, some Christians, if someone dies, they'll say, well, um, heaven got another angel. No. Heaven doesn't, human beings don't turn into angels. <laughs> angels are, are, are spiritual beings. We have the good angels and we have the fallen angels. Satan only took a third of the fallen ones, right? But you don't turn into an angel. Do you know that you were, the Bible says you were created a little lower than Elohim? And in the King James, they translated it angels, but it was a wrong translation. If you look that word up, Elohim, it means God. You were created a little lower than God. You were created in his image. Amen. You are precious in his sight. The Bible says all those angels out there are ministering spirits sent to minister to the heirs of salvation. That be you. They're in heaven's army for your benefit. And you know what they move on? The word of God. They hearken unto the word of the Lord. That's what they hearken unto. And so if, if you have your Bible in your lap or your Bible on your device, if you stick it up to your ear, do you hear anything? The word of God coming out of your mouth is what they hearken to. We just prayed that prayer when we called those demonic spirits down out of those, uh, off of this nation, Right? So look at this in Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man. See how he says certain? And he names the name. Let me just stop here real quick here. Because I want you to know this. Sometimes when Jesus tells a story in the Bible, it's a parable. It's not an actual account. It's a parable that he uses to illustrate a point. Like the parable of the prodigal son. I believe that is a parable. He's telling about the son that went away and the son is dead. He's just giving a parable. He he does that to give meaning and to, to um, give insight. And also a lot of the parables are prophetic too. This is an actual account. This is something that happened. And so you have to know that. He says, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, and the rich man died also and was buried. Okay, now he's going to talk about what the rich man experienced after he, was di after he died and was what? Buried. What part of him was buried? His body. Dust to dust, ashes to ashes, right? Now, and I want to say this. It just so happens to be a rich man in here. It's not a sin to be rich, Amen. right? Some people get the verse wrong and they say money is the root of all evil. Oh, really? I thought the Bible said the love of money. Hey, I'll help you out. If you've got some evil money on you, I'll take it. <laughs> right it's the love of money right that's the root of all evil and so but does you see where it says he died someone say he died and he was what buried he lives on after that look at this in verse 23 and in hell or Hades he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off in Lazarus bosom let me just stop right there he, he is in his spiritual body he his physical body is in the in the ground but he still has a spiritual body because he lifts up his eyes someone say eyes he has eyes and he looks across this big gulf and he sees Lazarus in Abraham's bosom he recognizes Lazarus he didn't lose his memory did he he recognizes Abraham who lived thousands of years before him. He's still complete. And in that way, his body is in the ground, but he lived on. Now, Abraham's bosom is where the Old Testament saints went when they died. Hell is in the center of the earth. 
Hell, Hades. And in the Old Testament, it's called Sheol. It's in the center of the earth. And to give you a cross-reference, if you want to care to look at that, Isaiah 14, 9 says, Hell from beneath um, awaits, and they will be brought down to Sheol. Sheol. And so hell is in the center of the earth, but until Jesus came and literally died on the cross and, and completely paid for the sins of, of the Old Testament saints, their sins were just covered. They were covered. They were considered righteous because of their faith. That's what those animal sacrifices were for. The, the, when they sacrificed the animals for the sins, the high priest would sacrifice it for himself and for the sins of the nation. They had to do it every year just covered. When Jesus came and, and paid the price for their sins, he took them out of there. He went into Abraham's bosom. And the Bible says he led uh, captivity captive. He took those Old Testament saints that were captive, captive in, in, in Abraham's bosom because they couldn't go to, to heaven yet because their sins weren't cleansed. They were just covered. Satan still had that over their head. Well, when Jesus died on the cross and paid the price for their sins, he went down there, and when he ascended into the heavens, he took them with him. And I'll give you a scripture. I don't have time today, but you can look it up later, and you can see that, um, that what I'm talking about is right. And I had thought I'd written it. Oh, he, he's in Ephesians 4. You can look at it in Ephesians 4. So, in the Old Testament, when they died, they, they all went to the center of the earth. Hades was separated, in, or Sheol was separated in, in, the, in the two categories. Abraham's bosom, which was the paradise side. It was a holding tank. They weren't in torment. Then you had the torment side. Do you see what I'm saying? And so in the Old Testament, it's Sheol. New Testament, it's called Hades. And so he's telling us a story, what it looks like down there. And so look at verse 22 again. It says, it came to pass the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So he made it over there, right? The rich man also died and he was buried. And verse 23, and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and in Lazarus' bosom. So he, he can very much see and recognize things, right? He did not become a mist. He did not become a vapor. There's no such thing as purgatory where people can go and their soul or the spirit can go and just and, and for a time and then before something gets worked out. No, nope. the Apostle Paul is very clear. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord if you are a believer. Now when a believer dies, they go directly to heaven. Their spirit does because all the sin has already been paid for. These people just had to wait till it actually happened. But when, when a, when a non-believer dies, they go to a place called hell. There's no other chance. Purgatory was started by the old Catholic church, and it was used as a way to make money. Because when, when someone's loved one died, they would say, well, if you pay the church so much, we'll pray them out of that purgatory. There's no such thing as a purgatory. It's not recorded in the Bible. There's times where the Bible says that they, they were asleep. When Paul says they, they, we, don't, we won't sleep like those others. When he uses that word, he's talking about death. He's talking about physical death. There's no, there's no uh, purgatory. And that's important that you know because the devil, I mean, some people might even be foolish enough to think, well, I'll just live in sin. I don't know why you want to live in sin anyway. Living for God's a lot better. But anyway, anyway. They say, so I'll live in sin, and then I'll go, if I go, if I go, if I die, I'll go to purgatory, and my wife will pray me out of there. She's a good God-fearing woman. No, ain't nobody praying you out of there. You got to get it right here. Amen. Jesus said, if you confess him, he'll confess you. Amen. Amen. And so look what he says here in verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. Look at this. That he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. 
And so here we can see that Lazarus still had a finger. He still had a, a, a spiritual body that had fingers because Lazar, um, the rich man says, send him, let him dip his finger in the water and cool my what? Tongue. So the spiritual body lives on, but the spiritual body can be tormented and tormented in flames and, 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 but never die. It's not uh, flesh and blood and bone like we have. I find it interesting that the rich man called all the shots up on, on the earth. I'm sure up on the earth, if he needed a drink of wine, he would snap his fingers and they would bring him the wine. But when he was down there, he had no authority. Nothing. And God never intended for one person to go to a place called hell. But the Bible says they'll have to enlarge, hell will have to enlarge his mouth for those that go there. So verse 24 again, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, son Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that, that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, and neither can they pass to us that would come thence. And so what he's saying is, when you're down there and you're in there, you're not going back and forth anywhere. If, if someone has a loved one that has died and gone on, they're not coming back until the, they're coming back during the rapture and the resurrection, only as high as the sky, and, and their bodies will be resurrected from the grave, but they're not here now. And they're not talking to you. They're in heaven. They're in heaven. Amen. The Holy Spirit will talk to you. God will talk to you. But they're not talking to you. They're on a whole different planet. Right? And then look at verse 27. This part is very interesting. Then he says, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Now he wants Abraham to send Lazarus up to his household. Still trying to call the shots. Look at this. But you know what? This part gets me. He says, I have five brethren. Did he remember that he had five brothers? So that's an answer to your question. When we're in heaven, will we know each other? Yes. He remembered he had five brothers. I believe the only thing you won't remember is the bad things. You've got to remember what Mickey Robinson said in that film that we watched. Heaven's more real. The spiritual world is more real than this world. And when he died, he never felt more alive. And he said, the colors in heaven are greater than these colors. I've heard other people say that. Everything's so clear, crystal clear and alive. You're not going to go to heaven and be like a zombie. Like You're children of God, created in the image of God. You'll be in your spiritual body, this spiritual body in, in the form that when you leave your, your body. But one day, you're getting a glorified body where God will either resurrect your body or you'll be caught up in the rapture, whichever, wherever you're at when the time comes. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, your body will be changed. That uniting of the spirit and your physical body will be changed from corruption to incorruption, from mortality to immortality. That's your glorified body. That's the body you'll live in forever. And God's going to remake the earth and you're going to live here forever on the earth. In the new earth, in the new atmospheric heavens. The kingdom of God's coming down here. New Jerusalem is coming. That's your eternal city. Why don't Christians read about New Jerusalem? We can get all excited and say, I'm going to Disney World. Well, I'm, Disney World's fun. <laughs> well, you ought to say, one day, I'm living in New Jerusalem. And it is a beautiful city. It's the headquarters of all the believers. It's, 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 it's so beautiful that the Bible describes it, but you'll never really know until you, you can see it. But you know what the best part about New Jerusalem is? God is there. 
And God's going to do away with the physical sun, the S-U-N, and, we're, and when he make, remakes the earth, we're not going to even need the sun because he will like this planet. You have a big God. We got a lot to look forward to. The only thing we need to do is say, well, not do, is say, well, I'm fine and my family's fine and, and we're good. No, there's other people out there that aren't fine. And somebody rescued you, so you're to go rescue them. Amen? That's why God put his love in your heart. The love of God's been shed abroad in your heart. And, and the spirit's in there so you would have strength, supernatural strength and love and compassion to go win the lost. Because if they don't get it right with Jesus, they're gone to the wrong place. So verse 28, says, For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, that they also, lest they also come to this place of torment. He didn't want his brothers to come there. Did he? Still had love, still had compassion for his brothers. And Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, listen to what he says, they will repent. The rich man knew what, what he didn't do, didn't he? He said, they'll have a change of heart. They will repent. They'll come, they'll come to you, God, if Lazarus goes up there. But that's impossible, right? In verse 31, and they said unto him, and he said unto him, if they, ha if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded that even though one raises from the dead. And so that was an interesting conversation, wasn't it? T turn up one more scripture, then I'm going to close. Revelations 20, verse 11. And so let me just recap this. When, when a human being dies, their body goes to the earth from which it came. At the time of the um, resurrection and the rapture, the, the, the bodies of the believers are going to be resurrected. Their spirit body is already in heaven, right? It doesn't matter what condition those bodies are in. God is bringing, God is bringing those bodies back. He loves these bodies. He created these bodies. Those bodies will be resurrected and they'll meet their spirit in the air and they'll be changed. You can read about it in 1 Corinthians uh, 15. You can read about that. And then when the ra and, and after they're resurrected, then those who are alive and remain, it says in 1 Thessalonians, will be caught up together with them in the clouds. Then that's when the rapture happens. I believe we are the generation that are going to be caught up together. And then these bodies will be changed also from corruption to incorruption, from mortality to immortality, because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We get a glorified body. That body never gets old, never gets sick, never dies. That body is more alive than the body you're in now. That body's in tune with God forever. That's good news, isn't it? So those people that were in Abraham's bosom, the, the Old Testament saints, Jesus, according to Ephesians 4, took them out of there and took them when he ascended up into the heavens. He took them out of there. Abraham's bosom is empty now. But Hades is still very much occupied. All right. This Revelation 20 shows you when, when God's going to empty out Hades then. All those people are going to go to the great white throne judgment. That's the one you don't want to go to. That's the one you won't go to if Jesus Christ is your Lord. Amen. That one's just a mere formality. Because all those people there are going to give an account for their life that they've lived. They're going to try to be right with a holy God without Jesus. Can't do it. No other religion will get you right. No other person, place, or thing, but a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That'll get you right. So look at Revelation 20, verse 11. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, and from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened, 
and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Look at verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, or Gehenna, as it's called. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So when it's all said and done, all Hades and all the occupants and Satan himself are going to be thrown into the lake of fire, Gehenna. Jesus talks about it. He, he says it's a, in Matthew twenty-two thirteen. 13, he says they'll be cast into outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so Jesus spoke about hell a lot. You know why? He didn't want anyone to go there. So it is very much a real place. It is very much a place that, that the Bible says that, that the, the way to hell is broad and wide open and many go there. Didn't Jesus say that? He said the, the road to heaven is small and narrow. Jesus is that road. And so I encourage you today, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day that you make it right. Today is the day that you say, Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord. I'm all in. I want to tell you something. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't work for it. Ephesians 2.8 says that salvation is a gift, not of works. At least any of us can brag about it. The only way you get right with God is by receiving the gift of righteousness, which is Jesus. Remember, every hair on your head is numbered. And he loves you. Hell is not about God's hatred. Hell is about uh, a destination that God has made a way that we don't have to go there. It was a big deal when Jesus died on that cross. The biggest deal. Imagine that. God, the Son himself, came here and took on our body and took our place. It was a big deal. So I encourage you, if you have not made Jesus the Lord of your life, do it today. Ask him into your heart. Ask him to come in, and he will come in and be your Lord and Savior forever. Because the Bible said nothing will separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's all I have. Would you rise, please? I'm going to ask for the um, prayer ministers to come up, and they can come forward. And I wanted to, um, I, wanted, I felt led to do it this way. If you need to talk to someone further about what I just discussed and, and, and you just want to just get in there and you feel like you need more, um, you need prayer in that area, that's, I completely understand. They're coming to pray with you on that. They're coming. So you have to um, do the step. You have to um, make the effort. If you need prayer about anything, they will pray with you, they'll be with you. And then God will do the rest. One thing that you can know about this church in here, for lack of a better word, I'll say it this way. We don't mess with anybody. We don't, like, try to get into your business. We don't, like, you won't have someone you shouldn't have, usually. But if they do, I just, they might have forgot or never told them. But you won't ever have someone come running over to you and try to force you to go to an altar call. We let the Holy Spirit deal with you. Amen. Amen. We don't do that. Let the Holy Spirit deal with you. And uh, um, then, you, then your salvation, you've got to work it out between you and God. But I want to tell you, this is not the time to be pulling out of the things of God. This is the time to be pulling in. Because things are heating up out there. Amen? And I'm telling you what, there's great things coming. So let's get together, let's get on the same page, and let's glorify God with everything we are. Don't forget tonight, our power, 6 o'clock. Come on out if you can. Let's pray. Father, we come to the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to bring the word. I thank you, Lord, that I brought it with a sincere heart. And I brought it, Lord God, with love in my heart, Father. And so, Lord, I pray, Father God, that you would just speak to each and every heart in here, Lord, and minister to them. 
And Lord, I pray that you keep them safe and happy and healthy as they go about their ways, Lord. Give them the desires of their heart, Lord. And, and I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our church going forward. I thank you, Lord God, that we will come behind in no good thing, Lord God. And, and Father, I just thank you for um, just giving us the joy, unspeakable and full of glory. Lord, there is joy in the house of the Lord. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So if you need prayer, come on.